CFA Society Nigeria. For more information, visit us at cfasocietyng.org. CFA Society Nigeria, making finance a force for good. Morning, good afternoon, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I'd like to say, on behalf of the Board of Governors of CFA Society Nigeria, a big welcome to everyone. Uh, can everyone drop where you are signing in from uh, into the chat box? Uh, I'd like to say a big welcome to you to, to the eighth edition of our quarterly leadership series, uh, a series established by CFA Society Nigeria to draw from the well of um, experience of prominent leaders uh, for the benefit of members and non-members as well. Um, it's not my job today to introduce the guest. I'll leave that honor to the Vice President of CFA Society Nigeria and the person of Chukamadu Abu to give the opening remarks on behalf of the Board of Governors of CFA Society. Chuka. Great. Thank you, Yemi. Um, yeah, thanks for the introduction. And, you know, in addition to what you said about, you know, people dropping where they're calling from or where they are, they are participating from, I would also um, suggest you highlight where you think the Naira should be, the, the exchange rate Naira to the dollar, because that's, that's a big topical issue these days. Okay. Um, yeah. So good, everyone morning afternoon evening because i know people um joining globally from from different um countries and cities um yeah so basically i'm welcoming you to the eighth edition of the cfa society nigeria quarterly leadership series my name is chuka madrabum as um as yemi mentioned and i'm giving i'm giving this opening remarks on behalf of Ibuku Oyedeji, the president of CFA Society Nigeria. She's unavoidably absent and she sends her regards and she'll be joining us towards, um, you know, as, um, as this session progresses. Uh, we are, we are we're grateful for your support, you know, for our mission, which is basically promoting ethics and prof professionalism in the investment management sector. Here at the Quarterly Leadership Series, we strongly believe that effective leadership is key to the success of any organization. That is the reason we bring together prominent professionals and captains of industry who have distinguished themselves. The expectation is that they share their experience with us and also inspire us to become very strong leaders. In the past edition of our series, we have had the pleasure of hosting some incredible speakers, including His Highness Khalifa Muhammadu Sanusi II, the 14th Emir of Kano State and the former go um, governor of the Central Bank. We also hosted Kala Harris, the former vice chairman and managing director at Morgan Stanley. We hosted Mr. Jimovia, the founder and chairman of Zeni Bank. We also hosted Mr. Ade Ayeyemi, the former group CEO of ETI, Ecobank Trans National Incorporated. Among other speakers, we've also had other reputable speakers. For this session, we are honored to welcome Dr. Sam Sudin Usman, CON OFR, as our guest speaker. Dr. Usman is an experienced leader and a highly respected figure in the industry. And we are eager to learn from his vast knowledge and expertise. He is the CEO of Sussman and Associates Limited, an economic, financial, and management consulting firm headquarters in Abuja, Nigeria. Dr. Usman has a BSc from ABU Zaria, an MSc and PhD in economics from the London School of Economics. He is also a fellow and past president of the Nigerian Economic Society. He is a fellow of the Society of Corporate, for Corporate Governance in Nigeria and a fellow of the Chartered Institute of Bankers. Dr. Usman has held several critical positions, including Honorable Minister 
of national planning from 2009 to 2013. He was also the Honorable Minister of Finance from 2007 to 2009, the Deputy Governor of Central Bank from 1999 to 2007, the Managing Director of now Merchant Bank from 1995 to 1999. He is credited with developing some, some of Nigerian's significant long-term national plans, such as the Nigerian Vision 2020. 20, 2020 and the National Integrated Infrastructure Master Plan. After leaving public service in 2013, Dr. Usman established Sussman and Associates Limited as a consulting firm providing advisory services in economics, uh, financial and management related matters. Since its establishment, the organization has exhibited a high degree of professionalism in its approach to business and, and development services and has developed monitoring and evaluation systems for the Northeastern states, as well as for Lagos and Bauchi. Dr. Usman taught economics and, and business courses at the London Business School of Economics, Amadou Bello uh, University, Bayoro University Kano, University of Jos, and Enugu State's University of Science and Technology. Dr. Usman currently sits as the chairman on the board of the Citibank, Union Trustees Management Services, Songhai Health Trust, Green Springs Educational Services, Rainbow Educational Services, Nisa Premier Hotels, African Natural Resources and Mines, Ministry of Finance Incorporated, and has director on the board of Emzo Pharmaceuticals. Dr. Usman has written several professional papers with some published internationally and in, in local professional journals. He is involved in several NGOs aimed at encouraging the development in Kano. He's, he's also the chairman of Kano Jigawa Professional, uh, professional Forum Sorry, excuse me. Uh, I, I I got a prompt which distracted me. Yeah. So he's also he's also the chairman of Kano Jigawa Professionals Forum, the chairman of Kano Peace and Development Initiative, the vice chairman of Gidania Aleheri Community Center. On behalf of the board of governors and members of CFA Society Nigeria, I want to thank Dr. Usman for accepting our invitation today. We feel incredibly fortunate to have him as our guest. As you can see, he has a very, very distinguished track record. I'll move on to introduce the moderators. So the first moderator is Femi Ademola, the current MD CEO of ICO Capital Limited. Femi is a finance and investment professional of over 20 years experience covering audits, financial advisory, investment banking, credit analysis, risk management, relationship management, and the likes. He is a graduate of accounting and finance and a fellow of the Institute of Chartered Accountants of Nigeria. He has an MBA from the Lagos Business School, a master's degree in natural science from the University of Ibadan, and uh, MSc in Finance from the School of Oriental and African Studies at the University of London. He is a CFA charter holder and a member of our, of our advocacy committee. He is also an associate of the Chartered Institute of Stockbrokers. Femi, you're welcome. I'll move to the next moderator, Oiko Sola Samuel. Oiko Sola is a finance professional with over five years of work experience in the financial services industry, spanning across sell-side equity research, macroeconomic research, asset management, and the likes. She currently works at Ryan Merchant Bank, which is a division of First Rand Bank Limited, and it's a leading African corporate and investment bank, which is based in 
South Africa. In her role at RMB, she's part of a team of strategists and economists spread across several African countries, and they are tasked with providing corporates and institutional clients with detailed and timely analysis of uh, key African markets. Prior to her role, Oiko Sola worked with AXA Mansard Investments Limited. And she's a, she's a CFA charter holder and holds a bachelor's degree in chemical engineering from the University of Lagos. Thank you, Oiko Sola, for moderating uh, this session as well. Before we continue, I would want us to watch a brief video that captures the essence of CFA Society Nigeria. Can you please play the video? Thank you. We are professionals. We are impact driven. We are CFA Society Nigeria, a member society of the CFA Institute Global Network of Societies. Our mission is to promote the highest standard of practice in the Nigerian financial services industry and provide a vibrant community for our members. The CFA Chatter signals the holder's commitment to professional excellence. As thought leaders, we collaborate with stakeholders to ensure adherence to ethical standards, better education for professionals, and to build market integrity. We are the leading voice for advocacy in the finance and investment industry in Nigeria. To partner with us or become our member, visit us at cfasocietyng.org for more details. CFA Society Nigeria, making finance a force for good. Okay, thank you for watching the video. This video provides a glimpse into our mission and commitment to excellence in the Nigerian investment management industry. Once again, thank you for joining us. Please actively participate, share your questions and insights with Dr. Usman through, through the chat or the Q&A feature. Thank you. Over to you, Femi. Thank you very much, Chuka. And um, on behalf of all the participants here, over 200 of us, I'd like to welcome Dr. Samsudin Isman to this learning series this morning. Sir, thank you for accepting to be here to you know, show us the way that we upcoming can aspire to have the kind of interesting profile that I've been read that about you. You know, I mean, I believe I'm speaking on behalf of everybody here when we say that, you know, it's the outcome that we see. But you know, we know that quite a lot of things going on in behind the outcome of what you achieved that we saw. So quickly, sir, before we delve into the technical question, I would like you to describe yourself to us, sir. Tell us a few things about the roles that your upbringing also have in you know how your life and everything the outcome we've seen has panned out. Thank you, sir. Can you hear me? We can hear you now. Thank you. Okay. Uh, first, let me appreciate the CFA Society of Nigeria for inviting me. Um, uh, it's my pleasure to be here. Let me also appreciate the participants. Um, that there are so many. Uh, it suggests that you think you will learn something from me. I hope you are not disappointed at the end of the day. Uh, but um, I believe I will also learn quite a bit from trying to tell you about myself. Um, first of all, you describe me in the flyer and in the introduction as economist, banker, technocrat, and public servant. Yes, I'm all of those and more, as you pointed out, various honors, national honors, fellow of this, fellow of that, the youngest ever president of the Nigerian Economic Society, and so on and so forth. But to be honest with you, at this stage of my life, you know, all those things are not really my priority. They are to do with Shamsuddin Usman. 
at my age now, I'm more interested in in what way is Shamsuddin Usman making an impact on other people's lives. You know, so what I call the softer issues, um, I think are, are more important for me, my family. Uh, in this semi-retired stage, I'm able to spend a bit more time with my immediate family. Uh, I'm able to also, I'm the head of the only surviving son of my father who died about 70 years ago. So um, I'm the head of the wider family and we're doing quite a bit. We've established a foundation in his name and we're doing quite a bit to assist the large number of uh, descendants of his. The last time we counted, we are about 700 now. Uh, so assisting with education, with, you know, things that will make each person to be self-sufficient. Um, in the introduction, you also mentioned quite a number of uh, um, engagements that I'm in with um, at the community level, my community level in Gwale, local government in Kano. We established that foundation about uh, 30 years ago. And I believe that today is one of the most successful and um, foundations that has ever been set, particularly at the local community level. If you see what we have achieved in terms of education, in terms of health, in terms we have a microfinance bank, one of the earliest to be established, that is assisting people with entrepreneurship, and uh, um, the hospital or the community center that is currently running, we're running it together with the Medicine Song Frontier, uh, is the second in terms of delivery, just to give you a figure, we are delivering over 200 babies a month in that facility. Uh, and it's just not the community alone. People are coming from all over Kano. Uh, to, to use the facility. Uh, so those are the things for me at this stage that give me all the pleasure. Uh, my health, of course, is another. Um, I, I get into 75. Um, every time I do a medical checkup, the doctors, if they don't know me, have to look at my age and say, are you really as old as you say you are? So I thank God for all those uh, um, um, uh, favors that he has granted for me. Um, I have also had the privilege as a Nigerian of really knowing Nigeria, you know, both schooling and uh, working. There is no none of the 36 state capitals that I have not been to several times. In fact, the way I brag about it is there is no town worth its name in Nigeria that I haven't been to. So, and that gives you a different perspective when you are talking about Nigeria. You can always picture what that place you are talking about is, what the people are like. And uh, um, so that I think has been part of my background. But um, my early education, first of all, I lost my father as you had when I was just four years old. And it was a big struggle. Um, the, the wider family was there, but my senior brothers were all either in school or just beginning to work. So it was tough. Um, I went to school barefoot. So it's not uh, President Jonathan alone that went uh, walk to school barefoot. Many of us did so. Uh, in fact, those days, the, the time you get shoes is probably only on Saturday. And it's such a poor shoe that within weeks it's, it's gone apart because it's not that expensive. So most of the time we walk to school and I know I know hunger. There are days when my mother will look me in the face and say, sorry, I don't have three pence to give you for your breakfast in school. You know, and I could see the pain in her eyes. Uh, go to school like that, hungry. And by the time I come back, she has struggled to do something, at least put food on the table. So it, it was uh, quite tough. But, um, and then you are going to school also at that time, many people didn't go to school in the North. 
uh, Western education. Of course, we had all very early Islamic education. That was a very good foundation that one had. But Western education, sometimes you are on your way to school and people are taunting you uh, that uh, because you are going to Boko school, uh, you, you are going to hell. Now, those who are taunting us, unfortunately, later, they realize the mistake of not going to school and all of them, without exception, struggle to get their children into education. And the support that I personally got involved in giving is, is realizing that I could have been one of those people if I didn't get the opportunities. So that's why I'm paying a lot of attention to this uh, community work. And my advice to professionals is yes, especially those of you who are young, you have to build yourself up, you have to uh, get the CFA, get the positions and so on. But all along, don't forget that you also need to have some impact on people, you know? And you don't say, I'll wait until I'm retired before I do that. But if you do that, it's too late. You have to find the time. God has given every one of us only 24 hours. Some people after work decide to go to the bar. Others decide to sleep. But you need to take one or two hours and devote it to some changing the lives of people. When I meet people today, some of those that we assisted through this community for 30 years ago or more, and somebody just last two weeks, I was we landed in Lagos, and one of them stopped me to say, do you remember me? I said, sorry, I don't. He said, look, you paid my jump fees when my father could not afford to pay for them. That's what got me into the university and now I have a PhD and I'm working in so and so place. You know, the pleasure that you get from that is just immeasurable, much more than you can get from any salary. So serve with integrity, but also remember to impact um, other people. I hope that is giving you a brief um, introduction of my background. Thank you very much, sir. I mean, that's quite very loaded, and I think we've learned a lot from that. I mean, one very important thing I can pick up from that was that arguably the loss of Papa at that tender age. Again, I'm sorry about that, because for not somebody not to grow with, up with a father, it's quite very, very difficult, really at that time. But then you are able to pick up the pieces. Is there anything that was powerful to now making you decide that you are going into finance and economics and not... Teaching, which is the typical thing that people of those areas, I mean, it's the kind of thing that you do, or maybe even something else more, I mean, uh, subtle, rather than the finance and economics there. Is there any pivotal thing at that time that make you choose that? Well, quite interestingly enough, I actually started out uh, very early with a mixed career. Teaching has been part of my my. My, my my career for quite a while. If you see, um, I in those days, after secondary school, all level, you there's a gap of one year before you go to a uh, high school certificate. So during those nine months, I actually taught in a secondary school. That was my initial lesson with teaching. Uh, after my first degree, um, I took a job with the Kano state government as a planning officer. But um, within a few, just a few weeks, I decided that I was not going to be a civil servant, especially at the state level. But I just realized that, that, that is, I was not going to be engaged enough, both intellectually and uh, experientially. Uh, therefore decided to take up my pending offer uh, for a master's in the London School of Economics. But when I came back after the master's, I actually became a full-time teacher in um, um, ABU uh, before I then moved to the banking industry. But while in the banking industry, up to the time I was managing director of Nal Machamba and beyond, I was actually doing part-time teaching particularly in the MBA programs of Bioro University, University of Jaws, 
uh, Enugu State uh, uh, University of Science and Technology, um, Abuja University. So I've, I've, I've had my share of um, academics also, but it's, it's a part-time, uh, sometimes in fact, uh, um, pro bono. Um, the second bit I did in uh, Bayer University was actually pro bono. Uh, I just felt, again, it's one of those things of giving back to society. Um, I felt I needed to, um, I was lucky to get educated. During my time, I was always on scholarship, uh, st particularly state government scholarship. Um, even though we paid some fees in secondary school, and it was a big struggle to get my fees paid, every brother had to contribute something before they could put together initially 12 pounds and later it had to even be reduced to three pounds because it was a big struggle to put the school fees together so those things actually made me feel that now that i've been lucky to have been educated with public funds um i had a duty to also give back uh, some of that uh, to students and it always made a difference uh, with somebody who is teaching both with a theoretical background, but also with having done things practically. Uh, and the students always found it uh, quite refreshing that somebody is talking from a um, um, theoretical background, but also based on experience. So what led to my deciding to be an economist? I think it was almost purely by accident, to be honest with you. All along, right up to... Uh, by the time I got to King's College for my HSC, I really wanted to do to become a medical doctor. You know, I, uh, in in secondary school, I was the last person to decide on my selection for WAIC, and the principal announced my name in assembly that I needed to go and see him in the in those days. If the principal announced your name in assembly you know that you are in trouble. Maybe you've done something very grievous. So when I got there, he said, young man, you are the one who is delaying everybody. I said, sir, I'm sorry, I, I I, want to, he said, "What do you, which subject do you want to pick? I said, I wanted to do science. He said, why? Because I want to be a medical doctor. My results were as good in the arts as they were in the sciences. So he said, let me see your hand. I stretched my hand. And my hand was shaking partly because I was standing in front of the principal. He just dismissed my hand. It was on our boom and he just said, go away, you can't be a good medical doctor. And he chose arts for me, you know? So that was one accident. The second was in King's College. When the WIAC results came out, my science aggregate was better than the arts. I went to the principal and said, sir, because of this now you can see, I've got all the science subjects that I needed for medicine. He looked at the results. He said, yes, okay. But reflect on it. If you come back tomorrow and say you want to do medicine, I'll change it for you to science. I got out, talked to a couple of the science students, and one of them warned me. He said, look, we're sure you are capable. The problem is we have done so many practicals. Already the term, first time is almost, almost finished. How are you going to cover up all those practical that we've done? And they take hours. So that was, again, my that was how I parted from medicine to, to economics. And then even ultimately, after the results came out, it was the influence of a friend of mine who, I didn't even know what economics was, to be honest with you, up to that point. But a friend of mine, a classmate in King's College, you know, uh, kept saying that he was going to do economics. So I just, when I was filling the form for university, I put economics as my first choice. And I was lucky. I got admitted both by University of Ibadan and you know, ABU. I'm not going to bore you with why I chose uh, ABU <laughs> over Ibadan. The, the same friend, the same friend, he, he didn't get, I, Ibadan gave him uh, French, not economics. ABU gave him economics. And so we were so close. When I got him two weeks before resumption, I had already paid my this thing in a bottom, getting to go. And he wrote a letter to me to say he's not going to a bottom, he's going to ABU. 
So I rushed last minute and paid the deposit for ABU. So that's how accidentally I ended up in ABU and in economics. But having discovered the subject, then subsequently, obviously, I grew in love with it. Thank you very much. I mean, I can resonate with that because I kind of have something a little similar as well. I wanted to be a doctor as well, but here, here I am now, crunching numbers. Exactly. Thank you very exactly. much. I'm going to yield yes. to my co-moderator, Oye Kosho, I'm going to ask some other you know, industry questions now. Thank you very much. Oye, please. Thank you, Femi. Uh, thank you so much, sir, for sharing that very interesting story. Um, I'll move on to the next couple of questions. Um, like you've you know, highlighted, you've led a very industrious career in government, in finance, and in the private sector in Nigeria. And so we're, we're eager to gain some insights into your, your leadership principles, um, the principles that have guided you through these um, distinct career paths. So sir, if you could please share some of these key principles that have consistently you know, shaped your approach to leadership across these uh, various sectors. Well, I think first of all, it's leading by example. That's very, very important. It's not what you say to people that matters, it's what you do. Uh, so in every situation I found myself, I lead in the front. And I am I'm, I'm very, uh, this thing about, strong about leading by example. Of course, Pursuit of excellence and setting of high standards, another important uh, feature. Ethics and integrity. Again, in that regard, I lead by example. Uh, if you check the records, for example, in terms of ethics and integrity, up to today, two of us, when I was Minister of Finance and my Minister of State Finance, Mr. Remy Babalola, for the record of the only two ministers in Nigeria that have ever publicly declared their assets. When President um, Eradua declared his assets publicly, we were in his government. We felt if the president shows that example, well, who are we as his appointees to be hiding our assets? It's not required by law. The law requires you to declare the assets and give it to the, uh, um, you know, uh, the relevant institution that uh, supervises that. But we felt that if the president can do it, and this is a president who really wanted to change the country, he want, he admitted that the election that brought him to power was, was faulty and set up a committee to address how Nigeria's elections can be done in a more open and transparent manner. So we felt that we needed to do that. And anybody and everybody that has worked with me in all the institutions that I have worked with will um, tell you uh, my point about ethics and integrity. I also encourage teamwork. Uh, I'm usually also very open with my uh, people reporting to me. Um, I don't know if you have been to the offices of many ministers. They are locked, you know? So you can't just go and open the door and get in. As minister, I never ever locked my door. And I used to tell, uh, particularly the staff in the ministry, that look, my door is always open. You are free to walk in any time. Of course, you have to check with my secretary who is sitting close to the door as to whether I'm in another meeting I'm free. But if you have something very important, even if it means interrupting a meeting, walk into my office. With the caution, however, that I don't encourage gossip. So if you know what you are coming to do is just gossip, or just to come and say, oh, God, I come to greet you, and there's nothing behind the greeting, then don't come to my office. And I extended that same invitation to the house as well. You are free to come to my house if there's something important you want to talk to me about or discuss. But if you are coming to gossip, 
about people, about, you know, or just to say, I have come to greet you, looking for favor or something. Uh, you are not welcome either to my office or to my house. I think finally, I believe in building people. Um, I'm not saying this with pride or anything, but um, I, down my career, I have actually um, helped a lot of people to climb the ladder. Like they say, if you climb the ladder, don't don't remove the ladder. I leave the ladder there, but I also not only leave the ladder there, but I assist people up the ladder. Um, uh, since we are talking to a lot of people who are aspiring, um, particularly to do something meaningful in their lives, um, I I would just give one example of you know, the kind of building people that I do. As I said, just to, so people see that I'm not just talking, there are several people, but one good example is, uh, um, I'm sure most people know uh, Dr. Yemi Kali, who was a uh, statistician general. Um, I didn't know Yemi from heaven. Somebody, I was looking for an assistant that is good with, uh, um, an economic analyst and somebody, he was working with Stambik IBTC at the time. Somebody mentioned his name. When I saw his CV, I asked Stambik IBTC to give him to me on loan as an assistant. They they kindly did. And he, he worked with me for two years. When I moved to finance, he also moved with me to national planning. Now, when an opportunity came up, a vacancy for the statistician general. A lot of people considered Yemi too young because he was the youngest ever person to be in that post. But I was aware of his capacity, you know? And uh, I went up to the president. I, it was my duty to recommend who was to be the next one. I recommended Yemi. Even the president at that time, President Jonathan said, Shamsuddin, are you sure? I said, yes, I'm sure. Because he trusted me, he approved the appointment. Now, all of that is history. I think I was completely uh, um, vindicated by his tenure performance as the statistician general. Now, so there are many examples of people like that that I, I have created bridges for. Um, I gave the example of him, not because... Uh, I hope he's not on the call, but even if he is, uh, Amy is not to embarrass you. Uh, Amy and I have become very close. In fact, uh, I'm sure he wouldn't mind if I use him as an example. So those are my some of my 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 um, ideas of leadership. Yeah, thank you very much, sir. Um... I like that you mentioned ethics because that's very that's very important to us here at the CFU Society. Um, I also like that you touched on openness, and I'd just like to share with the participants just before we started this call, um, we asked Doctor what we should address them as, just to attest to you know openness as one of the ethos of of Doctor as as a leader, and he said we should call him <laughs> Shamsuddin. And we all laughed and said, you know, <laughs> we can't do that. So he, he kindly obliged that we address him as sir or doctor. But yeah, I just wanted to, you know, buttress your point on, on you being a very open leader. Um, I'll move on to the next couple of questions. Um, still on leadership, um, can you share a memorable experience from, you know, your time uh, in active service where you had to navigate a difficult leadership decision or situation and what lessons did you learn from it? And um, I'll just merge that with another question. Um, if you were looking to fill a leadership role today, you know, what qualities would you be on the lookout for? Thank you. Difficult leadership decisions. Of course, in my, I mean, over 40 years of experience, I have come across so many, so many, but maybe I'll just give you one one example that always um, resonates when this kind of question is asked of me. In 
1995, I was appointed the managing director of Nal Merchant Bank. Before that, I had been a general manager in the bank, but I had left for, to become the DG of TCPC, the progenitor of the BPE today. Uh, we started the whole privatization exercise, and I was the COO of that organization, the, D, the, the, the DG, Director General. So when I was appointed MD of NAL, I came in, NAL had changed a bit. NAL initially was the, lead, the only marching bank. It was the first marching bank in the country. So it was a leader. You know, it bred a lot of those people who later became, went and, I don't want to mention names again, so people don't, but I'm sure you know them, those who passed through NAL and became icons of the banking industry. But NAL in itself had started declining, both in terms of business and in terms of some of the strong ethics that had established the bank. I came in and I was faced with one immediate challenge, which was, you know, merchant banks were not allowed, and I think they are still not allowed to collect deposits from the public. Yes, from corporate institutions. So we were always struggling to keep the liability side of the balance sheet strong because that's what helps you to build the asset side. So I came in and within a short period of time, our deposit base was weakening. And I said, look, what, what's happening? What do we have to do? And those in charge said, Oga, the only way to do it is, you know, by that time, some of these bad practices in the banking industry had started. They said, we have to pay commission to people who bring deposits to us. If you don't pay commission, they'll go to other banks. By that time, you had all these new, new generation banks. So maybe some of them were paying the commission. But I felt that was not what used, what used to happen in now. And that's I didn't want to be associated with that. So I said, no, I am not going to pay anybody commission for bringing deposits. Because we're, pay we're, we're, we're not taking them free. We're paying interest on those deposits. And we're paying better rates than the commercial banks. Now, apparently, some of the staff must have been involved in the whole game. Because within a short period of time, our deposit just started disappearing. You know, people were taking their money away. And every time I say, what's happening? They say, oh, God, we told you, you know, if you don't, if you don't pay these things. Luckily, one of them was from a person in the public sector, one of the public sector agencies. So I called him because they didn't know that I knew him. I said, look, what's happening? You know, you removed your money. Uh, is it because of, he said, well, I don't know. I'm not involved, but I also heard that the director in my organization has been involved in something. And when I queried it, I was told that this payment goes right up to the MD of the bank. You know? So I just said, ah. So you could see my dilemma. Do I join them? Or if I don't join them, what can I do to plug the gaping hole that is being created deliberately? I had almost a sleepless night, but by morning I had come up with a strategy. I identified three of the top commercial banks because the commercial banks are always awash with funds. And luckily, I knew their MDs. I'll mention one of them because he's still alive and he can corroborate. The, and he was the one who gave me the biggest assistant. Uh, Chief Joseph Senussi was then the MD of First Bank. I went to him in his house after work and told him my problem. I said, please, please help me 
to break this corrupt network. This is the amount of deposits I require in order to make a statement. And I need them for a minimum of 90 days. When he heard my story, he said Shamsuddin is approved. The following day, First Bank gave me this huge deposit that was more than any amount that had been taken away. And I told my treasury people, this is it. If you people will not go out and get deposits, I will, I will personally lead it. And I'll make sure that our deposit base is never threatened. Of course, the other two banks also came in with and that I'm not going to pay a cobo of bribe to anybody for giving us deposits. So I think the lesson for particularly the younger people is many of you, unfortunately, have not grown up in a Nigeria where things were done on merit. Things were done because that is the correct way to do them. Many of us, the older people, we grew in that region. When I got admitted to King's College, <laughs> I told you, my father died when I was four. I was not the son of anybody. It was based on my results, on the performance in examination, all the way from Kanu to Lagos to come and do my A-levels. The same with uh, admitting to Government College, KP, which was one the best secondary school in the North at the time. It was based on our performance. You didn't have to be the son of the prime minister or the son of the premier. In fact, we went to the same school with the son of Tapa Abalewa, Government College, the, the, the public secondary school in the north. All on merit. That boy was admitted because he also passed the exam, not because his father was the prime minister. You know, so I think if you are in this kind of a situation at work or anything, if you are creative, you can always find a way around these challenges. It's very easy to join them. Very, very easy. You know, it's the easiest thing to do, you know, but your conscience will be pricking you all along, throughout your life, you know? And also, you see, the credibility that you establish at that stage. For example, when jo Joseph Sanusi was made the governor of the Central Bank, four years later in 1999, and he had an opportunity to recommend four people to be made deputy governors in the central bank. I'm sure is that kind of engagement that I have with Chief Joseph Sanusi, that he recommended me to be one of the deputy governors in the central bank and President uh, Obasanjo approved. So, you know, though you, you, you just, sometimes you may lose something, you may lose. It's not always that you are able to win. But at least you can put you, if you lose that kind of, if I had lost, I still would not have agreed. But I put my head on the pillow four or five minutes later, I'm asleep. And today I walk about, I don't turn my back because I'm, lo I'm not expecting anybody to come looking for me with a gun because I've done a deal with him that I refuse to set, you know, because I never did deals with anybody. So, and it's that credibility that now has given me an opportunity to serve on many boards. I'm currently the chairman of seven boards and a member of three others. These are just commercial boards, uh, not to talk of all these various development associations and professional associations that one is engaged with. The, I think the second question you ask is uh, what, what quality do I look for in a leader? I think first and foremost, it has to be the technical capacity. And this is why I think all of you that are in the CFA uh, society are, 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 are potentially are good people for any job that is, you know, not only in the finance industry, Yes, primarily in the finance industry. So the technical capacity, management skills, uh, competence, motivation. Because if you don't have those, 
you may be the most uh, cooperative person, you must be the most honest person, you can be whatever. If you don't have that technical competence, uh, you can you can do it. You can do the job. The results delivery is very important. Uh, uh, I spent the last almost four years as a minister of national planning focusing on delivery of results. You know, it was my initiative that we started this performance measurement in government, and we led to a situation where every minister signed a performance contract between them and the president. And it was my uh, privilege to actually monitor that exercise and ensure that ministers uh, um, presented quarterly reports to the Federal Executive Council and then to the Nigerian public thereafter in terms of what they've been able to achieve. So results delivery, uh, communication is very critical. You, and the communication has to be both ways. Uh, um, I have talked about integrity and ethics. Uh, communication for me was very important, partly because, as I said, I have this background of being a teacher. You know, a teacher always tries to explain. And what one of the things that pleases me when I'm trying to explain to subordinates and take them along, my point is when you see the sparkle in their eyes, that tells you, okay, I've understood what you are trying to communicate. Or you, you actually see. And I find that in the process of trying to explain something to people, you yourself actually <laughs> get taught, you know, if they have other perspective. And by trying to explain in detail, you give them the opportunity that, look, I'm not a boss, I'm a colleague, you know? So you can speak back to me, provided you have reason. I'm willing to listen to you. When I went from academics to banking, uh, this was in 1981, uh, from a lecturer in ABU to banking, very reluctantly, because at that time my my ambition was to become a professor in the university system. Uh, but I learned banking from the people for whom I am. I was head of department. I was given a head of department. Um, um, in a department where some research is necessary, but practical banking skills I didn't have. But because I was open and I learned, um, some of the people that I learned banking from are still around. I'm using some of them today as consultants in my firm. Again, um, 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 I can probably mention one, engineer Edith Ekere. I uh, was working in the Nigerian Industrial Development Bank, which is the BOI of today. He was one of those in my department uh, that um, actually taught me how to, I had studied accounting before, but how to practically go from an idea, construct a balance sheet, tear it apart, and make give a reason as to why a bank should support such a project. Uh, so again, one was open, one was able to learn. And what I always encourage people, at whatever age, be open. If you are ready to listen, you can learn. And sometimes you learn from the sources that you least expected. Uh, I encourage, in fact, you don't have to say, oh, you are not an economist, or oh, you are not a banker. In fact, um, sometimes you learn a lot more from people who do things differently. And I think one um, approach I always used to take was because of my background, whichever organization I got into, I always used to ask the question, why are you doing it this way? Why not? Why can't you do it that way? Um, is one of the reasons that Chief Joseph Sanusi made me the uh, coordinator of Project Eagles, which was a major a transformation project that we undertook um, in the Central Bank of Nigeria that really transformed the organization uh, from 
one that was paper driven to one that was completely real time online 24 hours. Uh, so those kinds of transformation initiatives arose because when I got into anywhere, particularly in the center of my I was always asking the question, why? Why are you doing it this way? Why can't you do it this other way? Because, and, and, and you find that if people are ready to listen and give you an opportunity, you can always uh, make an impact. I hope I've answered that question. I yes, can go on have. and on, but I thought... <laughs> You have. Thank you, sir. Um, I'll hand over back to Femi for the next couple of questions. Thank you very much, Aniko. I mean, thank you very much, Doctor. I mean, I can understand everything. I believe we've learned a lot from it. First, let me thank you again for what you did for Yemi Kaleb. I am certain that he's very happy with what you have said because it is not a lie. He himself has boldly stated this as a story of how he got to that position before when I had an engagement with him with the late Abad Okumaba. So, I mean, I can see he's very proud of what you've done, and we thank you. We hope that you do more for all of us as well. I remember very well when they started with you, with Lady Agbola working with Mbabalala then. It was a very interesting period, and we thank you for what you did for them. And at the same time, with the performance review stuff you initiated at National Planning, I was a part of that as well. I remember working with Dr. The Professor Stephen Zamoye to create a template to prepare a report. And I spent some time with him in his office then at the Ministry of Finance building to jump with something together. So thank you very much, sir, for those things that you've done. And the Project Eagle as well, of course, those are memory projects you've done. So I won't go into those kind of questions again. So my next question would be something that of a mix. You know, you've combined experience of private sector and public sector. So we are certain that, you know, you have some experience in both areas. And so is the current Minister of Finance as well. He has done a little bit in private sector and has done private sector as well. So we just want you to just, from your experience too, on that seat, hot seat, that even hotter now is what we're experiencing. What kind of, you know, comments can you make? I mean, any way you want it, what kind of comment can you make about what is happening at the Ministry of Finance at this moment, considering what the country is facing? Thank you, sir. Well, let me start first before I focus on Ministry of Finance, the similarities between the private and public sector, because like I said, I've been privileged to have worked um, in both. Essentially, I think differences arise from ownership, control, and management. In the private sector, ownership, control, and management is essentially very closely tied to the shareholders. It's um, many times it is the shareholders that are the owners that control and manage the business. Uh, in, gov in the public sector, usually <laughs> that's where the agency problem arises. Who are the owners? Take Nigeria. It is it, over 200 million Nigerians that are actually the shareholders. They elected the president in trust to, to manage those assets and, and their lives for them. The president in trust also elected or appointed the ministers and the palm sex and the various officers. Unfortunately here, the link between the owner and the manager and control is almost broken because it is governed also partly by the political process. How do you elect those representatives that will oversee how the president runs and that will give some of the necessary approvals? So there's what is called the agency problem. When the agents, people who should actually be agents of the public, begin to behave as if they forget that they are agents and they are actually doing things that are in their own interest. In fact, the book that I'm finishing currently. The title I've given, it is uh, Public Policy and Agent Interest, where I trace my experience as Deputy Governor of uh, Central Bank, Minister of Finance, Minister of National Planning, of how that problem of agency, which leads to corruption, which leads to all sorts of uh, issues. Um, unfortunately, I, there is no time to go into great details. Uh, some of the 
stability of employment is another, uh, where in the public service, you are almost guaranteed. I, I was quite amazed when I saw, I, I'm sure many of you saw in the social media, where the uh, labor leader in the Ministry of Works was publicly castigating the Minister of Works for doing what? He locked the door on people who came late to the office. In the private sector, you just, the MD will fire you if he wants to. But we used to joke among ourselves, ministers at the time, that even the president, the way the civil service is set up, even the president cannot dis, uh, dismiss a laborer, you know, or a driver in government because the processes are so long and tedious that, and there's so much protection by in the system that by the time the president has given instruction for the person to be put through the process or to end up in dismissal, maybe the president would have finished his term uh, and gone uh, before his uh, uh, instruction is uh, implemented. Now coming to the, but in spite of that, let me not scare some of you that want to come into the public sector. I'm actually a, a, a somebody who encourages that. And I, I have called from time to time on say the head of the civil service of the Federation. Maybe he needs, or he, she needs to come up with a scheme that allows, you know, people from the private sector to come in to the public sector on some kind of a sabbatical. So like the university do sabbatical. I think we should arrange for that before you become a director in the public service, you must go out and serve in a very important position in the private sector. And then vice versa, we should allow maybe middle level people, your CFA uh, associates uh, and, and those who have just succeeded in getting their CFEs uh, to come into the public sector, spend some time. I'm sure it's going to be something that will mutually beneficial. So I'm not discouraging you. Uh, when I was setting up the uh, performance management department in national planning, I deliberately recruited 25 first class people who are in the private sector doing performance measurement management in the private sector, in the development sector, 25 people. We brought them in, we started the department with them because I realized the capacity was not there in government. Unfortunately, I've been checking, very few of them have remained in the system. When I was there, I protected them as much as I could uh, because being how brilliant they were, many of the civil servants saw them as a threat, you know? And the fact that they were in this very important department also, I think. Uh, and, and maybe some of them got a culture shock and left uh, after I left as minister. Uh, but I would, I would suggest that um, it's something that if you are considering it, it's well worth it. But don't go in thinking that somebody is going to lay a red carpet for you because you have a CFA. Uh, if you go with that kind of attitude, then you will have a culture shock. And um, I mean, I'll give you the, one of the first culture shocks I had. When I was made deputy governor of the central bank, uh, we used to act for the governor, the deputy governor used to act for the governor in turns. When it was my turn to act for the governor, he was not around, we, were, we had a meeting. I came in without thinking, I went straight and sat in the chair of the governor. I didn't know that in the civil service, no, you don't. And people, I was surprised. People were just looking at me like this. This man is, he has sat in the governor's chair. In the private sector, if you are acting for the MD and he's not there, you sit in the MD's chair, don't you? You don't even think about it. But in the public service, apparently I had done something quite grievous. And of course, rumors started that went even up to the governor. People who are trying to set the two of us apart. Be careful with this man. He is trying to take over your job. You know, just because I sat in a chair that was designated for, for the governor. So you will meet a lot of obstacles. Now, the situation of the current Minister of Finance, 
I really, really don't envy him at all. He's probably having one of the most difficult, between him and the governor of the Central Bank, um, both of them are, are, are very good friends. I have interacted with them. Um, I don't envy any of them. He's in a tough situation, but it's also an opportunity to make a mark. You know, that tough situations always create an opportunity to make a, a mark. I've had some personal discussion with him. Um, he is under a lot of intense personal pressure with limited resources and vested interests, um, like I mentioned. Um, I was privileged to be the Minister of Finance during the 2008 and 2009 uh, in global financial crisis. But the situation was completely different. We had the armor. We had the resources to fight that situation. Uh, uh, oil prices jumped from $134 per barrel in June 2008 to about $39 per barrel in February 2009. So Nigeria's revenue dipped significantly. But the difference is that we were fortified. The foreign reserves of the country were about 53 billion. In the excess crude account, we had over $30 billion. So, you know, we had the armament, we had the armory. If anybody tried to, you know, speculate with the Naira at that time, we could actually render them, make them lose money. And because of that, and we had the cooperation of the other tiers of government, particularly the governors. We all came together, uh, set up a committee uh, chaired by the vice president and took all the necessary measures that were needed to actually deal with the uh, uh, um, crisis. And I was delegated to go to Lagos and address the private sector and agree the measures that they also needed to take. So that crisis, the, the global financial crisis came and almost past Nigeria, a lot of ordinary people didn't even realize that we were we had the danger of getting into a recession if we had not taken some of the action. But the situation of the current Minister of Finance is really, really um, different. The resources are not there. Um, but again, um, I believe that some of the measures that uh, they've taken uh, are what are needed. Um, it's just I hope that Nigerians will have the patience uh, to for us to wait for them to take take shape and take, take um, implement. Thank you very much, sir. I mean, the, we can see that this will wind is not only even localized to Nigeria. It appears that every I mean, a lot of African countries are suffering the same thing as well. I mean, is there anything that you can you know? Talk about in that. Uh, what are the challenges that increase the economic development across Africa? I mean, just uh, yesterday we had about uh, the Egyptian Central Bank. I mean, tightening their monetary policy by increasing by six hundred basis point. Uh, we know that South Africa is having its own struggle. We know that oh, sorry, Turkey did six hundred. Sorry, we know that uh, Egypt is having its own struggle. No, I think it's Egypt. Yeah, Turkey is doing six seven percent inflation. So I mean, most of this world were developing countries that. Facing serious headwind, what exactly is happening? How you know? What 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 are you saying about those kind of things that are happening? And because it affects Nigeria as well. We don't want to localize. Well, you know, many of the uh, it's a resulting from first of all the COVID situation we went um, through, um, and unfortunately, many of the governments went into overdrive uh, post COVID in trying to actually. Uh, prevent their countries from going into a recession. So a lot of uh, liquidity was pumped into the system. Uh, so we literally, and this is the difficulty with this kind of economic policy. There are lags in terms of when you decide on policy, there are lags. You also sometimes uh, cannot estimate the effects effect co correctly. So sometimes you overreact and uh, then the the the, the um Russian um war uh has also contributed um significantly um 
But in Nigeria, I think, unfortunately for us, it's really, really the way over the last, uh, particularly the eight years of the Buhari administration and all this uh, granting of ways and means, pumping over 30 trillion naira into the economy, you know, without properly actually ensuring productive side of the economy, just for consumption. Uh, I have in a couple of uh, 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 a couple of uh, WhatsApp groups actually given an example that the governor of the central bank didn't have to. You don't always do what the government wants you to do or what you think the government wants you to do. You look at your position, particularly as governor of the central bank, is essentially to control inflation. That is the first and foremost, uh, you know, and I, I gave an example of the time when it was under President Obasanjo, when we were in danger of actually, the government was in danger of breaking the limit of the ways and means. And as the deputy governor operation at that time, I was receiving calls from several ministers. They are sent in their requests for disbursement. And we had actually told the accountant general story. If we meet all these disbursement requests, we will be, the government will be breaking the law. So it got to a point where some ministers reported the governor to President Obasanjo. And the governor took me, said, let's go and meet the president. We went. You know how powerful President Obasanjo is. You know, governor, why is it that I hear you are blocking uh, government from operating this and that and that? And uh, Chief Joseph Senussi said, Mr. President, what we can we can we can't do it because it's against the law. If we pay all those uh, requests, we will be helping you to break the law. And if you break the law, it can be a basis for impeachment by the National Assembly. In spirit, I mean, President Obasanjo had to now come down and say, all right, okay, what can we do? It was then we suggested to him a solution, which is prioritize. It's not all these requests that are of priority. So let's work with the Accountant General to prioritize, select which ones are absolutely necessary, and we pay for those, but still staying within the limits of the law. And President Obasanjo said, go ahead. You know, so really, it, it's not. I think it's it, it speaks of the character of the person as well. Uh, you know, if you tell the president the truth, and I have been involved in telling president the truth, especially one on one, they are ready to listen. Especially if you show them that look, if you do this, you are breaking the law. No president will deliberately go out of his way to break the law knowingly. But if he asks you to do something illegal and you go and do it then then it's you um it, it's it's you that is uh demeaning yourself thank you very much sir thank you doctor Tony Kosola, over to you for the last two questions before we move to the others that have not been answered from the uh participants thank you thank you femi um i think we can move on to participants q and a now we just have about 15 minutes left um so we have a question from Badamosi at AME, and he says, uh, this is so insightful. Um, if it has been done before, it can be done again. Um, I think he was alluding to your to your uh, comments on uh, meritocracy in the, in the public sector. So he's asking, how do we return to this meritocracy standards in Nigeria? Um, if you have any ideas uh, on how we can pivot to that, please share, sir. And um, I'll just merge that with, with another question from um, Ebuka Emebina. He says, Dr. Usman, good morning. With your experience, kindly advise 
what you believe is the one single economic planning action Nigeria must take to achieve better welfare for citizens to avoid a wasted decade. Um, I hope you got those, sir. Yes, I have. Um, how can we return to those days of where integrity mattered? To be honest with you, some of us, our hope is in you younger people, you know? Unfortunately, again, sometimes I was in another WhatsApp group and somebody came to the, drew our attention to the fact that, well, you people are putting all your hopes on these young people. But look at what is happening to some of the young people that in government, that are in government, that are being tested. They are not <laughs> performing any better. And it's probably, again, understandable because some of you actually Anybody that is 40 and below probably never grew up in a Nigeria where things worked, you know, where you were selected for something based on merit, where I remember carrying my box from my home one to going to secondary school on my head because nobody to escort me to the train station. And at nine o'clock, brum, brum, a bell is rung and the train departs at nine o'clock. This is Kano to Potako train. And it's predicted to arrive Zaria, Kaduna, Kafanchan, and so on, up to Potako, almost five to 10 minutes maximum, you know, from the scheduled time. So my hope for some of us that have Say stepped aside, we are still around, we're still trying to mentor people, uh, is that it's you, the younger generation, that will redeem our country. How that will be done again, unfortunately, we don't have time to go through. Uh, but um, I can engage with some of you. Um, I don't mind uh, if uh, the CFA Society uh, makes my email available to those who do want to engage further. Um, one single economic action that is necessary, I think we need what is lacking in Nigeria is really achieving particularly elite consensus on the development path for Nigeria. When I was articulating the vision 2020, I studied and visited all countries that have used the vision as a basis for their transformation, Indonesia, Malaysia, India, you know, I went to all those countries and on a learning point. I interacted with their planning ministers, with their finance ministers. The amount of work we did to put, as Femi has mentioned, to put that vision document together, you know, was so enormous, but at the end of the day, there was no consensus. You need to build a consensus, especially by the elite. To give you an example of that lack of consensus, we recognize that you needed to legislate the vision. You needed to have a legislative foundation for it. And I took a draft bill after approval by the Federal Executive Council to the National Assembly. I think that bill is probably still, uh, you know, vegetating there. You know, partly because at that time, if you didn't have the resources to support your bill, your bill is not getting going to get accelerated uh, uh, here. So lack of uh, elite consensus, and we are actually a approaching a point where we are all of us the elite in danger. See all these attacks on food trucks, on food stores. The big danger we're all facing if we don't come together and save the situation is who is going to be next? If they take away all the food in the stores and in the trucks, well, I don't want to sound alarmist, but it's happened in other countries. You know, we are the ones who are in serious danger. So 
we need to come around a consensus development plan. It's not, it doesn't sound elegant, it doesn't sound, but we need a strategic plan that everybody believes in. Uh, when I went to India, for example, they were going through their 15th, no, 20th, five, sorry, 15th, five-year development plan. And each one was successfully implemented. So there was continuity. Here, unfortunately, you change a minister, and if you are not lucky, all the work that he has done goes down the drain with him. Or but particularly, you change a government. The only probably surviving, I did extensive work in terms of reconstructing the planning framework for Nigeria. The only surviving element is that uh, infra infrastructure, 30 year infrastructure master plan. Luckily, every government that has come since then has at least agreed to work on that. Yes, it has been modified over time, but that is what other countries like Malaysia, um, Indonesia, you know, did. Continuous development, governments changed, but the focus on development uh, continued, building on top of each other. We are lucky that President Bola uh, Tinubu uh, has established that tradition in Lagos. Lagos is one of the states that has, and I worked for Lagos. One of the earliest jobs I got when I set up my farm was to work for the Lagos state government in terms of this resource-based performance ma management. So I know uh, the level of continuity from one governor to another in Lagos is unprecedented. In that regard, actually, I found that as at that time, the Lagos state government was far ahead even the federal government in terms of implementing a performance-based uh, management system. And that is because of the continuity uh, that has uh, been the hallmark of Lagos. Thank you if very much, a few, Yes. Yes, I think we can take just one or two more questions. Um, First, you have spoken about your your memoir. If you can give us some, you know, a few snippets into the memoir that you're about to finish and when it is coming out. And um, secondly, just because I've seen this question pop up quite a number of times, um, the we we I'll just point out one from an anonymous participant. He says that um, in thinking about working with civil service uh, right now considering the low pay structure, bureaucracy, and et cetera in the system, um, how does one succeed without any compromise? I think this question is so important. I will start with it. Um, what I found from my experience, particularly those 25 people that I recruited into the performance management department, is that people are willing to sacrifice for Nigeria. You know, many of those guys, ladies and gentlemen, actually took a cut personal in terms of their personal thing, in order to come and provide a service for their country. You know, I was surprised to be honest with you. Some of them were working for financial institutions, be very well paid. And I said to them, look, this is this is this is the government scale. Some of them. Maybe they just wanted to do it for two, three years. Maybe that's why some of them left. At least they put it in their CV that I have done this and that. But many of them took a cut. When we were doing the Vision 2020, I was somebody tried to um, frustrate me by not uh, giving me enough resources from the budget. Having been a minister of finance, I just ignored them and went to the private sector. We had a private sector support group made up of about 500 people, top CEOs of all the companies. And I appealed to them. So they raised the money, at least for their own work. We didn't pay them anything. So they, they paid for their trips to Abuja. They paid for their hotels. They paid for their staff who worked for us. They even contributed to our payment of the consultants, uh, Mrs. Accenture, who worked with us at the time. You know, so. Uh, people are willing to sacrifice. People are willing, you know, if they are given the opportunity, if 
their, their value is recognized. Uh, you asked about my book. I've told you the title is uh, Public Policy and Agent Interest. And instead of just me writing, it's slightly about mem my memoir, but what I also did was to invite people who have had experience of implementing public policy. So that it's not all about Shamsuddin Usman. Uh, when the book comes out, it's a 15 chapter book. I wrote only four of the chapters uh, and the introduction and the conclusion. So you can see 11, I invited 11 other people uh, that contributed. I, I, since I have disclosed one person, I can tell you one of them is uh, Yemi Kali. He's written a, a chapter in the book. Uh, I begin to show how one actually, you know, brings people up rather than putting them down. Uh, Yemi is in a position to, he has written other chapters, other books, but I felt it was an honor. So um, other than that, I think uh, I'm not at liberty to disclose um, a lot more, except to say that which can actually serve as probably a very fitting conclusion to this uh, um, event today. Before I went into the public sector, I was one of those as MD of NAL at the time that were involved in the beginning of the uh, NGF, sorry, the um, Nigerian Economic Summit Group. I was there at the beginning when it was founded. And we used to, in our meetings, say that if only Nigeria can attend, can get the economy right, everything will be all right. After spending so many years in the public sector, I have come to this conclusion now that if we do not get the politics right, nothing will be all right. And that's in fact one of the conclusions I come to in the book, that getting the politics right is very, very important. And I've used illustration. The struggle I had with the National Assembly on the budget, the issue of, say, these constituency projects. You know, somebody comes and, and builds something and people are clapping for them. Where did they get the money? Was due process followed? Are those projects the best projects for Nigeria? For Nigeria, even for the locality, if they are saying they are doing it for their Constituency. Is that the best project for the constituency? And how I, who gets it in the constituency? Is it only your political supporters? Once you get into the National Assembly, you are supposed to be a representative of the people of all your constituency. You articulate projects that don't go through due process, that may not be in the priority of the national government, that may not even be in the priority of the state government. During my few years as Minister of Natural Plan, I actually undertook deliberately a visit to all government projects. And we paid attention along the line to those constituency projects. I led the team to the Southeast and I have witnesses. Peter Obi was the governor of uh, Anambra State at the time. You know, Peter, how simple he is. He accompanied me to go and visit some of the constituency projects or some of the projects of the federal government in Anambra state. And I was shocked. Everyone we went, he said, look, I'm the state governor. I did not even know that such a project was being implemented. <laughs> Yet the governor is the owner of land in, in the state. And if you are doing it for the people, certainly your project should be aligned with what the governor of the state is doing, even if he's of a different political party. So you find Nigerians clapping for their representatives because they have brought this project up. Do you know how much was claimed to do that project? Sometimes these projects are done by the sisters and brothers of the representative or the Senate. They are done by people, you know, 
Very few of them go through any due process, if any. So anyway, the, um, I think I should I should stop here so that I don't get uh, tro into trouble with, with the current uh, members of the National Assembly. I've had enough trouble with with them. Let me not uh, create not more. <laughs> Thank yeah. you very much, Doctor. I mean, we appreciate. I mean, the kind of question we we'll have been asking is, oh, how are we going to get to see all these things you've done, and how are you going to communicate them? But I believe the book, the memo you're writing, will definitely answer all those questions for us when they are definitely held. And I'm hoping that society would uh, follow with you to let us know when it is held so that we can take part in it and buy the book as well for the audio learning. So thank you very much for the time spent. I would like to call the uh, Secretary of the Society, Musa Babudu Serfe, to give us the closing remark. Thank you. Go ahead, Musa, can I mute? Yeah, look, uh, thank you, uh, Femi. Uh, thank you so much. You know, uh, Doctor has already agreed that uh, they should share the the email with with members so that we can communicate further with uh, with Doctor. Um, thank you so very much, uh, Doctor, for accepting to to be with us uh, at a very short notice. This is a very insightful, very inspiring, uplifting, profound words uh, for some of us. This is the time we have gotten someone who was on the top in terms of uh, the private sector, and then on the top in terms of the public sector, giving us a linkage between the private and the public sector, and then the challenges that we can find in, in that public sector. The, the, policy, the, the public policy and agent uh, interest is uh, something that we will be very, very much interested in looking at. So we'll be expecting to see that the issues that you brought out around agency problem and issues uh, in terms of uh, breakdown in contract, different issues that came up today are things that uh, we'll be very interested to take it up again with you, uh, Doctor. So we say thank you for accepting to share your experience with us. Uh, this is very deep for some of us. The QLS has always been a port that collects experiences from uh, our people who have seen it before, who have done these things, uh, and then come and share those experiences with our young uh, professionals who can now be inspired to for career uh, choices and also in terms of uh, their conduct. So we say thank you for for agreeing to participate uh, in this. I like. I like uh, something around the conclusion in, in, in the 15th chapter book that says, if we do not get uh, the politics right, then nothing will be right. And that is, that is really true. And I hope and I pray that one day we get things right to make Nigeria right again. Um, again, I say thank you to uh, Femi and, and Shola, uh, the moderators, for making a good mix in terms of the questions that uh, you brought out here and then making the, the whole conversation very, very engaging. The Society Office, we say thank you for coming together and doing the legwork to put this together. And then for all of us, the audience, you know, I will say thank you for coming to the feast. If the food is cooked and then you don't have anybody to come for, for the feast, you, you, we, we lose. So we say thank you so very much. The recordings are always available, and then we are hoping that we'll have uh, the traffics for this QLS and then the past ones. We have the recordings, and you 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 have opportunity to to view them again. So, on behalf of the board and uh, members of the CFA Society in Nigeria, including the Society Office, I say thank you everyone for being here, and then particularly thank you so very much, Doctor for giving us the opportunity to hear from your wealth of experience and then uh, and then allowing us to have your email to continue this conversation going forward. Thank you so very much, uh, everyone. It's my pleasure. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Yeah. decision to aim for a long-term and successful finance career. Taking the Chartered Financial Analyst CFA exam and studying the curriculum is an excellent way to ensure you have a strong knowledge base and top-notch skills. 
Are you ready to take the bold step to invest in yourself? CFA Society Nigeria is at your disposal, promoting the highest standards of investment practice in Nigeria. As an affiliate of CFA Institute, CFA Society Nigeria seeks to promote the highest standards of investment practice in Nigeria and to provide a vibrant community in which its members and other key players in the investment industry can interact and grow. When you have the CFA Charter, you're globally recognized. Take advantage today by writing the CFA exam and joining us at CFA Society Nigeria. For more information, visit us at cfasocietyng.org. CFA Society Nigeria, making finance a force for good. We are professionals. We are impact-driven. We are CFA Society Nigeria a member society of the CFA Institute Global Network of Societies. Our mission is to promote the highest standard of practice in the Nigerian financial services industry and provide a vibrant community for our members. The CFA Chatter signals the holders' commitment to professional excellence. As thought leaders, we collaborate with stakeholders to ensure adherence to ethical standards, better education for professionals, and to build market integrity. We are the leading voice for advocacy in the finance and investment industry in Nigeria. To partner with us or become our member, visit us at cfasocietyng.org for more details. CFA Society Nigeria, making finance a force for good.